Welcome to Sword of the Spirit, written and presented by Colin Dye, Senior Minister of Kensington Temple and leader of London City Church. Sword of the Spirit is a dynamic teaching series equipping the believers of today to build the disciples of tomorrow. We pray that you find these programs inspiring and a catalyst in deepening your knowledge of God, your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, and your intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit, a school of ministry in the Word and the Spirit. We've been looking at Jesus' teaching on the Sermon on the Mount and showing how Jesus instructs us about life in His Kingdom when we surrender to the rule of God, what kind of people should we be? How should we live on a day-to-day -day basis? And this teaching is so practical because Jesus, through the principles He gives us, guides us through daily life. It's not a new law that we follow and keep as if it was simply a matter of making rules and regulations and if we keep these rules and regulations, then we're going to be okay. But this raises us a question. What about the law of Moses? Do we follow the law of Moses? Is it applicable today? Is that how we should live in the kingdom of God? Jesus says, no, I fulfilled all that. You don't have to bother about that. I fulfilled all of that on your behalf, but I want a righteousness to come from you which is of a higher standard that is deeper, more radical than anything you've ever heard before. And Jesus explains this. He says, the sin of murder is not just about killing somebody, it's about being angry in your heart. And so he teaches us how to deal with that. The sin of adultery is not just about extramarital relations, it's more than that. He says it's about the lust in your heart. So Jesus says, deal with that lust in your heart, be pure from within. He goes on talking about how we should handle our enemies and how we should deal with so many different issues. And today's teaching, Jesus is talking about how we should speak the truth. And he introduces this by talking about the systems of oaths that were around in his day. Many people had different levels of truthfulness based on different levels of oaths. For example, if somebody said, I'm telling you the truth, I swear by the gold of the temple, then it was very binding. But if they didn't make such binding oaths, then they could get away with little half-truths and maybe sometimes outrageous lies. And so Jesus says, when you speak, your yes should be yes, your no should be no. When somebody is living in the kingdom of God, their life should be an open book. Their words should be honorable and trustworthy without having to make oaths and swear by this or swear by that to say, now you know I'm telling the truth. Somebody who is a disciple of Jesus should walk in truth, live in truth, and speak the truth. And so Jesus helps us understand the importance of truthfulness in the kingdom of God. And I believe it's a very important topic because in our world today, there are very many lies being told by very many people, but Jesus wants to lead us into a life of openness and truthfulness. And so he says, walk in truth, speak truth, and tell the truth. And if more people in the world were like that, we'd have a very, very better world in which to live. And so, I pray that as you look at this teaching today, and as you hear the instruction of Jesus, that your life will be filled with truth. Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit teaching seminar on the Kingdom of God. Our title is Rule of God. And last session we were really heavily under the rule of God as we looked at how Jesus handles the Old Testament law, the law of Moses, and radicalizes that law and shows us a much higher righteousness, a righteousness that will surpass even the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. And he takes examples of Old Testament commandments and what the scribes of his day had done to those commandments in order to make his point. He says, you have heard it said, but I say to you. He sets aside the, 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 the law and the scribal interpretation of the law and gets behind the law and speaks about that higher righteousness. He does it in relation to anger. He does it in relation to sexual sin. He does it in relation now to truthfulness. Truthfulness. And in Matthew 5, verses 33 to 37, it says, Again, you've heard 
that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but you shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it's his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king. Nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your yes be yes, and your no, no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. Now, of course, in the Old Testament, there were oaths, and you were called upon by the law to make oaths before the Lord. And so Jesus sets aside this requirement. You have heard it said, but I say, say to you. And uh, he states the legal position, you shall not swear falsely, but you shall prefer, perform your oaths to the Lord. Now, there is some indication here that the scribes were taking those last words to the Lord to mean those were the only oaths you were heavily bound to keep. So if you make an oath to the Lord, you had to keep that one. But if you made an oath, you know, in some other kind of way, and you swore maybe by the, this or that, then there was a kind of lesser binding nature of those oaths. In fact, there seems to have been a whole hierarchy of different oaths, and they were binding in different degrees according to what level the oath was. And so he says, this is, Jesus says, this is from the evil one, that whole system. And so he rejects the whole system of oath-taking as it had been developed in the first, by the first century with these people. That's why he says anything more than this is evil. And again, we see Jesus' rule is more radical than the law. It's broader in its application. He says, let your yes be yes, let your no be no. You don't have to say, I promise you I'm telling you the truth, or I swear that this is the truth, in order for people to know that it is the truth. If you speak it under the kingdom of God, it must be the truth. Otherwise, don't say it. If you say yes, it means you're speaking the truth. If you say no, you're speaking the truth, but your yes is yes and your no is no. <laughs> This, this means that you have to watch your speech. You don't think, well, I can just tell a little half-truth, or, or as we say, a little white lie. I'm bending the truth a little bit. I'm being economic with the truth. All of these things Jesus condemns when he says, you've heard it said, keep your oaths to the Lord, but I say to you, let your yes be yes, let your no be no. And really, truthfulness is sadly lacking amongst believers. We don't have any longer this idea that our word is our bond. We think that's some kind of old-fashioned sort of code of conduct belonging maybe to the army, the British army, or something like that. I'll tell you something, my friends. Your truth, the word of your, of your mouth must be truth. We serve a God of truth. God abhors a lie. Never, ever lie. And when you do, if you do, it's sin. Ask God to forgive you. Now, he's not forbidding all oath-taking. We know that God himself swears on an oath, and we may be called to Jesus, submitted to the oath that was placed over him when he was uh, before his trial in front of, uh, of Pilate and uh, uh, in front of the high priest and so forth. But we know from James chapter 5 and verse 12 that the a standard of Jesus was upheld by the early church, but above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes, let your no be no, lest you fall into judgment. James is just taking the teaching of Jesus and holding it for us in our lives right now. Then we need to look at this next section, which deals with rights. Matthew 5, verses 38 to 42. You have heard it said... An eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, not to resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. If anyone wants to sue you to take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. Whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn him away. So here Jesus is going right to the section, right to the heart of, of what we feel is our right and our due. Now there are, under the law, rights of individuals are protected. 
especially in a civil context. And it's not wrong for us if somebody steals from us. It's not wrong for those criminals to be caught and punished because what they have done is a crime. But Jesus is not talking about the criminal world. He's talking about your personal world. He's talking about what you want to exact from that person. I tell you what, I don't care what, what they do to them when they take them to prison, but let me take a hold of them and I will teach them what for. That's personal vengeance. And the, it seems to me that the scribes and Pharisees were taking these rules of Moses and were using them and teaching them it was possible to use them for your own personal ends. Now, Jesus says in the law, it's eye for eye, tooth for tooth, but I say do not retaliate. He's not talking about crime and punishment. He's talking about personal retaliation. Do not retaliate. Do not seek revenge from those who wrong us. And if we selfishly insist on retaining our rights, we will be breaking the principles of the kingdom. But on the other hand, living under the rule of God means that you don't retain your rights. And the world is crazy about its rights. The right for this, the right for that, protesting for this, rights, 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 rights. The world doesn't talk much about responsibilities. And uh, I'm not suggesting that this means we should become doormats. We can talk about the rights of minority groups within, a, within a, a, a nation that is persecuting them. And that's correct, that's righteousness, that's justice. But there's a big difference between standing for that kind of truth and righteousness, a big difference from that, between that and your personal vengeance when somebody wrongs you and you fall uh, afoul of them. Now, of course, the Bible makes this very, very clear in verses 39, 39 to 42, he says, don't resist an evil person. They slap you on the cheek, offer them the other. It is, that's how you overcome resistance. But if you hit back, it just exacerbates the situation. If somebody wants to sue you, give them, their, give them what they're asking for and give them more. He is not talking now about, as I say, law breaking. He's talking about your personal attitude, that you should be generous and you should be forgiving. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with them too. This is the law of the day. A Roman soldier could stop a citizen and civilian and say, carry my equipment for one mile. But it was against the law to make them go too. So Jesus says, carry that extra mile. And you watch the look on that man's face and you'll say, what kingdom are you of? Because you're certainly not of this kingdom. And that's what we can do in the world. Isn't that wonderful? We can go the extra mile do things that we're legally required to do, but go and go beyond that, and then that's a witness for Jesus. I like Romans 12, verses 17 to 21. G, uh, the, Paul says, Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink, for in so doing you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. In other words, love your enemies and drive them mad. Well, wouldn't it drive you mad if coals of fire were placed on your head? Now, what Jesus is saying here is, win your enemy around by your loving behavior. And if your enemy never, ever repents, and if your enemy never, ever changes, God will repay. Vengeance is his. I think we need to write that over the front of our Bibles, over our hearts. We should write it over our refrigerator, write it over every day of our lives. Vengeance is mine. I will repay. If you try to vindicate yourself, you lose your reward in heaven. And God says, you want to vindicate yourself? Go ahead, you make a go of it, you'll make a hash of it, and you will never, ever be satisfied with that. But if you let God vindicate you, if you don't try to justify yourself, if you don't try to retaliate and pay back, some people say, most people get mad, I get even. As if that's some marvelous principle to live by. Can you imagine God saying that to us? I'm not mad, I'm just getting even. Bang! We wouldn't survive three, well, a split second. Some people say, well, I forgive, but I can't forget. <laughs> Forgiving means forgetting. 
Did you know that? I will remember their sins and iniquities no more. Doesn't mean to say that the memory of that is erased from your mind, but it counts no longer in your relationship with that person, just as our sins count no longer in our relationship with God. And then finally, in this section, Matthew chapter 5, Jesus summarizes the whole of the law with this principle of love. And again, he contrasts it with what they were being taught and what the law said in the Old Testament. You have heard that it was said, Matthew 5, 43. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your enemy, love your neighbor, and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully persecute you, that you may be sons of my Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust. Now, of course, we don't ever read that we should hate in the Old Testament. It says in Leviticus 19, verse 18, you shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love the neighbor, your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. But it seems that the scribes had taken this and had developed it further, and, it's, and it says, you notice it points out, you shall not bear any grudge against the children of your people, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Well, he's not talking about our enemies. He's talking about our neighbors. He's talking about our friends. He's talking about our own people. So we can... Love them, but hate those who are outside. Now, they were then, because of their externalism and their legalism and because their hardness of heart, they were perverting the law of Moses into something that it wasn't. But Jesus takes this higher than even the law of Moses and says, pray for those who despitefully use you. Don't uh, retaliate. Pray for them. Love them. Bless them. And then he sets the royal standard for the, those who are in the kingdom. Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Here is the royal righteousness, the royal righteousness that comes to our lives. This is a high standard. In some places, Jesus intensifies the law. In other places, he varies the law and brings in a higher law, or not a higher law, but a higher standard. He points his, to his authority over the law, and he adds an internal dimension to the law. In all of this is saying, you must be like God, and in keeping with the very essence of who God is. And in Matthew 7, verse 12, we have this marvelous, marvelous summary again. Therefore, whatever you want to, men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. In other words, it's a whole life of love. It's the perfection of love that our lives are orientated towards others and to their interest, to what is good for them. And now from this point on in this sermon, Jesus' teaching illustrates this perfect, universal, all-embracing love which characterizes those who are ruled by God in the kingdom. And it's to this righteousness that we now turn. We're going to look at uh, the blessing of God in this way. Now, in section 6, Jesus turns his attention away from the general righteousness and the examples that he's given about living our life generally to talking about two specific ways in which we're called to live. Now, I'm lost for a few words. I'm lost for words here because I want to distinguish between what Jesus calls acts of mercy or charitable deeds, deeds of righteousness, that some people say, how it's translated in some Bibles, with the rest of life outside of that which is seen to be specifically religious. But I don't like the language. I don't like saying, Jesus is now showing you how to live your spiritual life, and then he's going to show you how to live your physical life, because physical life is spiritual if you lived it before God. I don't like the distinction saying, this is your, these are your religious acts of duty, because the whole of your life is to be lived in the same sense of relationship to God. But there are certain acts that we are called on, acts of righteousness, which are specifically orientated consciously towards the spiritual dimension of our lives, such as prayer, fasting, and giving. 
And it's to these that Jesus now turns his attention. Therefore, I've headed this, though I'm a little bit unsatisfied with my own title here, the spiritual life in the kingdom. So we, Jesus has begun with attitudes, and then he's spoken about the reaction of the world to those attitudes that we have in our lives as believers. And then our relationship with the world, how we're to relate to the world. And then he's given specific applications to show us what it means to live under the rule of God. And now he's bringing a new section in where he's talking about how we should live in the world. We're still in the world here. These aren't religious acts that take us out of the world. We're living in the world, but under the eye of God. God is examining your spiritual life. He's examining the whole of your life. But there are three things that Jesus highlights here where God is particularly interested because they are the religious acts, the things that express our faith in a kind of way that you would expect people who are serving God to express their faith. And so he says, live under the eye of God. We will find constantly the phrase, your heavenly Father sees you. Living under the eye of God. And that's the same way as living under the same uh, thing as living under the rule of God. It means total submission to him and entire dependence upon him. It means he is looking at us at all times and we're looking to him in dependence upon him. We are maintaining eye contact with our heavenly father at all times. And that's a very important discipline. So in Matthew 5, he outlined the character of the disciples describing how we should behave in society and the standards he expects us to live by. Now in Matthew 6, he offers a picture of disciples living the kingdom life in the world and he constantly emphasizes that we are living in the presence of God and under his all-seeing eye. And so the dominant theme of this chapter is our relationship with the Father as we live under the rule of God. And there will be a whole sort of the spirit manual and series of seminars dealing with the Father. And we will see in knowing the Father when we come to it what it means to live like this. But here we have the teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. Now firstly, in uh, chapter 6, verses 1 to 18, Jesus deals with, as I say, this term, our spiritual lives. And then, in verses 19 to 34, he focuses on our ordinary, everyday lives. You see the weakness in my language, but it's the best description that I can come uh, to, to, to bring to you today. So the kingdom is not just concerned with either one of these areas. God's kingdom is concerned about both these areas because God's rule is relevant to every area of our lives. So we may look at these as principles of kingdom spirituality. It means that our lives are lived constantly open and exposed before the Lord, especially as we pray, especially as we give of our sub substance according to the will of God, and especially as we fast. Now, Jesus highlights these things because in these respects, we are very tempted to boast of our righteousness, to forget our poverty of spirit, to show off our spirituality. I call this showcase spirituality or sideshow spirituality. Roll up, roll up, everybody. Come and look at me. I am praying. Now, there's that attitude in every single one of us. Of course, we have given up the thought of being so obvious about the way we draw attention to our spirituality. But it can happen so easily in conversation when we tut tut other people. Like, for example, have you, uh, what did God say to you in your quiet time this morning? And you're saying, well, I had my quiet time. Did you? Well, actually, I, I, I skipped mine. Oh. And we be have become masters in the art of the spiritual put-down. Listen to your conversations throughout the rest of this day and the rest of this week, in case you've got enough self-control to control it for a day. <laughs> listen to the conversation of other people and listen for spiritual put-downs. Because when we engage in spiritual put-downs, all we're doing is going back to try and live under the law, to try and live under legalistic standards, to say, this is my righteousness, look how righteous I am, we're trying to build our own righteousness, again. 
This is hypocrisy. And there's a tendency in all of us, I know it's in me and it's in every Christian I've ever met, this tendency, we have to master it. And here it is, Jesus summarizes it by saying uh, um, in uh, Matthew 6 and verse 1, he says, take heed that you do not do your acts of righteousness. In other words, those specific acts which come into this category, and he names three of them. Take heed that you do not do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them, otherwise you will have no reward in heaven. Now there's a godly balance here. It's, at first this seems to contradict what he says in Matthew 5, 16. You remember? Let your light shine, so shine before your good works, that they may see your good works that they may glorify your Father in heaven. Now he is saying, don't. He seems to be saying, don't let them be seen. And of course, he's not, he's not contradicting himself. His first saying in Matthew 5, 16 states that we should let this light, the light of our good deeds, the light of our witness, shine, that they may see our Father and give glory to our Father. Here he is saying, be careful that you don't do them in such a way as you get the glory. Don't do them to be seen by men. Here, motive is everything. And again, let me tell you, you can't take the words of Jesus and interpret them legalistically, as we shall see. You can't. This is talking about the issues of the heart, the motivations of the heart. We are called to live in such a way that when people look at us and see what we're doing, they glorify God. They don't glorify us. Now, there are two opposite temptations which are part of the same problem. The one temptation is to become so ostentatious that we draw attention to our spirituality, and the other tem temptation is to become so introverted and so paranoid about this that we are hiding our self-righteousness behind a mask of false humility. And both are wrong. Both is hypocrisy because we're hiding behind something 